Cohen. <laughs> it's on, sweet. Uh, it's a thin crowd today. <laughs> uh, there's a career fair? Oh man, why am I here? I need a new job. Um, all right, so those of you who are here, uh, we're gonna talk about disks today. I thought people were working on assignment too. Yeah, silly me. Uh, everyone's done already, right? So it's due on Monday at midnight. Um, we might do some special help sessions on Monday night, firing out those last minute bugs, not to do the entire assignment, <laughs> although that would be pretty epic. Um, so how are people doing on this? How many people are done? Ooh, that's a small number. Wait, where's Yi Hong? He was done. Yeah, you're done. Just so <laughs> he's that we're afraid of being targeted. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right, so you have, a, you have the weekend to finish up. Um, please come to office hours. We have a good stream of people. Um, but yeah, let's <coughs> guys have Monday. Monday. Um, so we fin just finished our unit on virtual memory. Anybody have any questions about lingering doubts about virtual memory before we go? plunge bravely onward. And you guys will start to get a real first-hand look at VM next week when you start assignment three. All right, so um, today we're gonna start talking about disks, right? Um, I don't know where, I think I just lost a few of my slides. Hold on a sec. <sighs> Hmm. I guess I didn't. All right. So some. So how many people? Yeah, Mac. Good question. So our swap files. Like what are swap files? Are they, are they related to swap space? Or? Yeah. What What are swap files? So a swap file, like the the stuff. Let me take this off. The stuff in the page has to go somewhere. Right. You're going to move 4K of data out to disk. Now if you want to, you could implement your swap as a file, a file that is read and written to by the operating system that's located on disk. In a couple of weeks, you guys will have some sense of why this may or may not be a great idea. Right? So some operating systems like Linux, for example, reserve a portion of the disk as a swap partition. Um, the reason, so why why might it not be, I mean, you guys don't really know the answer to this question yet, but can anyone guess why it might, might not be a great idea to use a swap file to store 4K pages? Yeah, Doug. Um, uh, like, it's not always going to be the That's true, yeah, but let's assume that we can protect the swap file appropriately. You're going to have the same problem with the swap partition, right? Yeah. Yeah, basically. Like a lot of the features of files that we're going to start talking about today, like the fact that they can grow and shrink and things like that, you don't need with swap, right? And the rights to swap are very structured, right? Every right to swap is a 4K chunk. So you know, when you talk, start talking about files, you can write a byte to a file. And files have features that are set up to allow some of the things I just talked about, small rights, you know, growing files, shrinking files, things like that. Swap space is much more structured. And, and usually the operating systems try to take advantage of that by locating it in this particular part of disk that doesn't actually have a file system, right? So once we're done talking about file systems, you guys can, will be able to see sort of all the extra overhead there is to, to actually using a file as opposed to just write, writing to the raw disk box themselves. Yeah, Matt. So like when you open up BIM and you're editing a file and you open up BIM and you have a terminal window and you just try to edit a file again and says the swap file is found, so does that mean that like no, 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 no. That, yeah, Vim is not talking about an actual swap file. Yeah, yeah. Vim creates temporary files in the directory to hold the partial contents of the file. Right, so, so yeah, Vim is, yeah, Vim is not talking about real swaps. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
It's a good question, though. It's, it's a little bit of a confusing terminology. Any other questions about VM? That's a good question. All right, so let me, let me start off with some terminology, right? So when we talk about stable, we're going to start talking about stable storage. And, and we really re refer to two different types of stable storage, right? And, and these different types have very different characteristics. Um, stable storage in general, though, is storage that does not lose its contents when the machine is shut down, right? This is distinguished from uh, temporary things like RAM, right? So that's, that's the big difference between stable storage devices we're going to talk about and, and other things we've talked about so far, right? Um, at this point in time, we're sort of in this interesting era in computing where we still have um, legacy sort of, I'm going to call them legacy devices, but they're still present. In, I mean, how many people have a computer with a spinning disk drive? How many people have a computer with a flash disk drive? Oh, I'm telling you, man, you guys should get a flash drive. They're really fast. <laughs> it's really like you won't, you won't go back, right? And, and really, on some level, it, we're not going back, right? I mean, the, the technology you guys are using is going to shift towards using uh, flash as a form of stable storage rather than spinning drives, right? There's all sorts of interesting issues with spinning drives. Um, but frequently, we refer to these, you know, we use this terminology sort of an HDD. Right? How many people have seen this before? If you shop for drives online, you've seen these things. A hard disk drive. It's a spinning drive or a hard drive or a spinning disk. Right? There is a moving part inside that particular piece of hardware. Um, an SSD is a stable storage device that's, con that's composed of actual flash memory. Right? These are just circuits and transistors. There's nothing moving in there. Right? And that's partly the benefit of it. Um, at this, so these statistics are maybe a year or two old. Uh, but if you shop for drives, you probably know this. One of the reasons that, that hard disk drives are lingering around is because uh, they're cheaper in terms of dollars per byte than flash drives are right now, right? So that, <laughs> that was projected for SSDs in 2012, right? I guess that was probably last year. Um, and so, you know, you're, you're talking still about, and this is a gigabyte, not a GD. I don't know what, I don't know what a GD is. It's a special flash unit of storage space. Um, so, you know, they're still talking about an order of magnitude difference in price, right? And if you guys have looked at machines, you'll probably see this reflected in the, you know, you don't, you don't find a machine with a terabyte of flash. I actually think you can buy terabyte flash drives. I think the prices are like in the four or five figures, right? But that would be awesome. I really like that. I wish I could afford it. Um, yeah, so, and, and we're going to focus, we're going to talk a lot, at least for the next week or so, about sort of general file system design principles and how these apply to hard disk drives. But hard disk drives and SSDs are quite different, right? I mean, they both provide the same feature, but they have very, the, the way that they're built has very different implications for how file systems are designed. Yeah, Which James. Which one does SIS-161 simulate? SIS-161 has a, has a very bad hard disk model, right? <laughs> it does, I think, spin. There is some sort of rotational latency that's simulated. Uh, but yeah, yeah, it's pretty much an, an HDD. That's a good. That's a that's a good question. I mean, I think I, well, let's come back to that. Right. It, it might be true, actually. Um, I think let's put it this way: hard disk drives do better with certain types of sequential I/O. Right. Flash drives are great at doing a lot of little random writes. Right. And you guys will get a sense for why that is in a few minutes. Right. So this probably begs a question: Why are we studying hard disk drives? I mean, to some degree, the study of operating systems is. I think when we talked about it in the beginning of the semester, it's just sort of like you guys are studying like the, the great classics of computer science, right? You know, this is like the Monet's of the computer science world, right? This is not like, I don't know, uh, Jasper Johns, right? Or, or whoever the crazy people are that are, you know, working in art today. This is the old stuff, right? And, and hard disk drives start to make this feel like really, you know, paleolithic, right? Like, why are we talking about these things? Um, to, but to some degree, I mean, there's a couple reasons that we're still talking about spinning disk drives. One is that we're still living with spinning disk drives, right? And, and their, their price advantages over uh, stable storage are, will probably go away at some point. We'll just move, you know, in mass to this new technology. But they're, they're still around. There's still a lot of spinning drives out there. Um, and I'll come to that in a minute. I mean, the other, the other reason is there's, well, I'll probably get to that. Um, and then, you know, the file systems that we're, that we're studying, right? How, how many people really feel like they exploit the hierarchical nature of their file system on a daily basis? How many people have very complex 
directory structures for all of their files. I know I do this. I mean, I'm not <laughs> that embarrassed, right? We're like naming conventions, and you get like all oh, you write little scripts to like rename everything when you decide to change your mind about how things are supposed to be laid out. Um, yeah, it's it's terribly embarrassing. I spent a lot of time when I was a student writing scripts to rename my MP3s, for example. It's really important. Um, but a lot of people don't do that, right? They use that little, they use Spotlight, right? How many people use Spotlight or the whatever happened to the dog on Windows or, you know, whatever the equivalent of Ubuntu feature is. And the thing is, we're, we're all sort of being trained to do this by Google, right? How many people remember Yahoo? They're still around, right? Do, how many people use Yahoo? Yeah. Okay. Do you, I mean, do they still have that, like, the, the, at some point Yahoo was basically trying to build a directory of the entire internet, right? So, you know, you would like go and there'd be like subjects and you click and there'd be subtopics. And it was almost like they were trying to fit all the web pages on the internet into like a hierarchical file system, right? And that was hard. It's probably impossible. Um, and then Google came along and it was like, you know, type thing into the search bar. Even Google has actually made my typing a lot less accurate. And I don't know if you guys are having this problem because it's so good at detecting typos. So I'm just like, throw random characters into the box. And like, <laughs> usually I get what I want, right? Um, so, you know, search is really also changing the way that people are interacting with their personal devices, not just the internet, right? I think, again, I mean, if you look, you know, uh, at, at normal people who use computers, not you guys, they don't know where their files are, right? If you gave them like a finder window even, or, or the terminal, gosh, you know, no way. They, they don't know where stuff is. Right? They don't know how the machine is laid out. They don't, you know, they're like, I downloaded it and then I clicked on it in the Firefox download thing or Chrome or whatever. Um, so, or, or I searched for it using the spotlight. So, um, but all this stuff, you know, if you look under the covers, it's still all built on, on hierarchical file systems, right? You know, that's, this is still sort of the reality that we live with. And maybe someday we'll have a machine that's just all a big database underneath, right? And people have proposed these designs, right? Where it's like, let's just abandon the whole hierarchical file system design. We're all so used to it, it's hard to even imagine what computers would be like, right? Maybe you open your terminal and it, it just gives you a Google type thing, right? Like, look for Python code for a project I was working on yesterday. And it's like, oh, there it is, right? Um, who knows where it is in the computer? You just type the search thing. Um, and, and to some degree, this is kind of, an, I think, a, a really interesting time to be studying storage because, because of the interplay between these two technologies, there's a lot of new sort of interesting designs for how to exploit memory and you know, how to sort of rebuild the storage hierarchy, right? And virtualization plays a role here as well, so this is kind of getting interesting. Um, and you know, all of this is, but all of this will sort of probably build on top of things that we've already done, right? And, and the fact is that there are some really fun you know, so again, I mean, some of the file systems that we study today, you guys aren't going to really ever use them. Some of them probably aren't even ever deployed on systems that you guys actually touch on a daily basis. But there's some really nice system design principles. The file system design was an area where for decades a lot of really, really smart people worked in it and they designed really cool systems. Partly driven by the fact that disks are so slow that you had to do a lot of smart things to make the file system perform well, right? But there's a lot of really cool work in this area, and there's a lot for us to learn from studying these systems. Um, and and I, I don't love file system design, I have to say. It's not my favorite part of operating systems, so we're not going to spend like a month on this or something like that. We'll get, we'll get through it. All right, so let's talk about disks. Um, well, just a little bit of terminology because you guys understand. And again, these are spinning disks, right? How many people have ever taken a disk apart or found a, a disk that was disassembled? Okay, so you guys have seen these things, right? Um, so the, the platter refers to the actual, uh, the actual physical uh, thing where data is written, right? So it's the circular flat disk on which magnetic, uh, which the disk stores data by, man by manipulating some sort of magnetic substrate, right? Um, and most platters have two sides, right? So the data can be written on either the top or the bottom, and that's, of course, to maximize storage space, you know, for the volume of the drive, right? Um, spindle is actually the drive shaft, the thing that the platters are attached to. Uh, that's the thing that spins these guys around rapidly. Um, there, your disk has multiple heads. The head is the actuator, it's the sensor and, and actuator that actually reads and writes data from the drive, right? And normally these are, you know, again, you have several different heads uh, at different po positions on the disk. Um, and these, this is kind of cool. These heads essentially sort of float. You don't want them 
actually touching the drive, right? And in fact, when they do make contact with the drive, that's usually the end of the drive. Um, but they essentially sort of float like nanometers over the surface of the drive, right? We want them as close as possible because I'm assuming that the closer you get, the more dense you can write and read data. Um, here's a picture. I, I didn't make this. I got this from the internet, right? So, you know, this is, this is more or less what you would probably still see if you, you tore open a drive today. Um, you have your, your spindle. You have a stack of platters, right? If you, you probably, if you did enough disassembly, you could probably pull these off one at a time, or maybe they're all sort of put together. Um, the heads are mounted on this arm, right? So this is an, this actuator arm, and this is what allows the heads to traverse from one edge of the disk to the other, right? The, if you guys have ever heard the noise that a disk is making, well, I'll show you guys in a minute. A cool, a cool video. Um, when we start talking about locations on the disk, yeah, Matt. Ah, sorry. So what do you guys think? How do you think this writes to multiple platters? Yeah, there's, there, this is a whole stack, right? So this actually looks like a comb, right? Oh. Yeah, and on, on, on each one of these, um, I wish I had a hand. <laughs> oh. <laughs> no. That's a, that's a flash drive anyway, so it's not going to help, sadly. I could take apart that one. Uh, anyway, so yeah, they, you, you, I, I should bring me out to see if I can find one. We probably have one in the lab that we can, we can bang apart. But yeah, this, this the, looks like a comb and sort of goes in sideways, right? And, and there's heads mounted on each, on the top and bottom, so that you can get to uh, both the uh, downward facing platters and the upward facing platters, right? This is a cool device, right? No wonder people got so excited about doing all this cool stuff with it. Um, so when we talk about where data is, right? So this is an interesting thing. I mean, there, like your MB3 is on here somewhere, right? Like the bytes for it literally are stored somewhere on this disk, right? In some physical location. We talk about the physical locations. We use some terminology. Um, a track, right? You think of a lane on a racetrack that runs all the way around the platter, right? So the tracks are different lengths depending on where they are on the platter, but they essentially it's a sort of a like you put a cylinder down. A sector. Uh, sort of resembles a, a, like a pie slice of one of the platters. A cylinder is a set of tracks vertically aligned. So a cylinder is almost like if you took a cylinder and sort of uh, vertically intersected it with the stack of platters, what, would you, what you would get would be the, the cylinder. Um, and there we go, right? So, well, it's, it's hard to see the cylinders, right? These circular guys are tracks, right? This, this pie thing is a sector, and then the stack of tracks that, that, that go all the way through the disk are, are assumed, right? All right, so ah, this is where it gets cool. Uh, disks are, because, you know, most videos of computers working are not very interesting, right? But disks are cool. Uh, all right, we're, yeah, sorry. I did something dumb. Go away. Okay, here we go. So here's your disk. This is the this, this spindle right here where the heads are located. This is the, these are the platters, this is the, sorry, this is the actuator arm, this is the spindle, right? So let's watch this thing, let's watch this thing do its stuff. Yeah, I'm glad this video is, yeah, there we go. I don't, I don't know who this guy is or <laughs> why he needs to advertise. Do not try this at home. Cool, right? That's what that noise is. Yep. <laughs> I've never figured this out on Windows. For some reason, deleting a folder is like a really expensive operation. It doesn't make any sense. All right. It shouldn't be. It should be like one bit. But it's not. There it is. Yeah, what else does he do? Let's see here. I think he does a format at one point. Oh, copy paste. Here we go. This is kind of cool. Because can you see it's going between two locations on the disk? You can actually see some locality there. It's kind of awesome. Yeah, there it goes. I think there's a format on here as well. Pretty cool. Yep. Yep. Well, it doesn't grab. No grabbing. <laughs> I'm grabbing a lot. Here we go. It's a quick format. Check it out. Boom. Done. I don't know what it. I don't know what it does. In a quick format. I 
that may or may not be the end of this particular power down. There we go. Cool. So this gives you some sort of physical intu intuition of what's going on, right? <laughs> and you can go to love the online. I, I don't know what that is. That doesn't make any sense. Um, any questions about that? So, yeah. Gabriel. How exactly How does the disk, I don't know. <laughs> it, it, I'm, I'm assuming there's some sort of magnetic signal that it's using to rearrange the. It's a little electromagnetic. It's a little electromagnetic. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So, what, a, what about it? Oh, good question. Yeah. I, I, wish I, I wish I knew the answer to that. Yeah. Yeah. This is way past my pay grade, right? <laughs> I am not an electrical engineer or a mechanical engineer or really an engineer of any type. <laughs> Computer scientist. So why was grab such a bad term? Uh, because you don't want to touch it, right? right. Yeah, yeah. I was so Oh yeah, it, it is grabbing the data, right? So, so you saw it's kind of cool with the copy and paste that there was a little bit of locality there. So it's picking up some data, putting it back somewhere else. Right? Again, I have no idea why deleting a folder is such an expensive operation. On this is a Windows system, I'm pretty sure. I read the description, um, but I, I really don't understand why that. All right, let's see here. Right, so. Um, and, and hopefully this gives you some sense of how disks are different than what we've been talking about so far, right? Um, and all of these differences end up playing a role in sort of how we design systems. So this is, this is kind of, despite the fact that I am not an engineer, this is kind of like a real fun engineering problem, right? You have this really interesting physical device. And a lot of the file system designs that we're going to see are based around really deep understanding of how these devices work and really careful engineering that tries to take advantage of various properties of disks, right? So the first thing, you know, uh, disks move, right? You know, this is important to emphasize. And, and that has a lot of interesting uh, results, right? One is that there's locality on a disk, actual physical locality, right? This is not address space locality. This is real physical locality, things that are close together, right? Um, disks, because disks move to some degree, they are slow. Right? It's not really a disk's fault, right? It's spinning, you know? I mean, how fast would you expect it to be? And, you know, you imagine um, when you're moving those heads, I mean, here's a big, I mean, I, I think the, the, the reading and writing of data is very interesting, but how do you get the heads across the disk so fast, right? I mean, those heads are centering on a tiny, tiny little track of data, right? And being able to move them that fast, that quickly, and then stop them and get them to center uh, to the degree where they can write data. Because you don't want data written like that, right? I mean, it, it really, you need it to be written real sort of tight constraints. So there's some really neat engineering here. And you could probably do a whole couple lectures about how disks are built, right? But I don't know how they are built, so I can't, I can't do those lectures. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it's hard, it's hard to see, right? But if you pulled out that circular part, what, what you'd actually have is like, you know, a, a bunch of platters that are you know, a, little, you know, a little distance between each other, right? Oh, no, 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 they're all the same size, right? It's, it's a cylinder, um, but each platter is sort of stacked on top of each other. And there needs to be enough room in between them for the heads to get in there, right? Because the head has to be able to go into the, into the in between each platter, right? But on the other hand, if you make the platters as close together as possible, you can put more of them in the same space, and you can increase the capacity of the disk. Right? So to some degree, you know, is the, the improvements that we've seen in disk capacity, right, um, and to some degree speed, are the result of better engineering. Right? I'm sure older disks, the platters were farther apart, the tracks were thicker, you know, so the result was you had less material and you had fewer tracks on that same material, as the heads have gotten better, as their, you know, the accuracy of the, the physical components improved, you can put the tracks closer together, you can put the heads, the cylinder, uh, the platters closer together, right? The heads get smaller, so every, everything. You can move the heads faster through the same sort of degree of physical articulation and center them quickly, right? So all these things are what sort of gave us, you know, two terabyte drives, right? 
I remember when I was in college, my friend was like, someday I'm going to have a terabyte of storage. So it was like an aspirational thing, right? And now like, you can buy them for like 100 bucks. So it's cool. Um, and, and so, and the other thing about the way the disks, you know, we talk about file systems, right? I mean, a lot of what we talked about so far is our operating system internals. File systems, there's been a lot more um, flexibility in the way file sy systems are designed. And operating systems sort of from the beginning when they were built were designed to incorporate this sort of flexibility, right? Which is interesting if you think about it. I mean, if you guys remember back to the, uh, the lecture about scheduling, right? One of the things that uh, Conkalibus suggested was that Linux have a more flexible scheduling architecture so that you could actually load different schedulers at runtime. You could switch between schedulers. The scheduler would be a more modular part of the system. I don't know if they ever did this, right? But for file systems, this has been the way things have been for a long time. I'm guessing that way in the back in the dawn of time, file systems were tightly coupled to the operating system, but very quickly they became something um, that you could sort of switch around, right? So you can take a disk, you can format it a certain way, the operating system knows how to read or write to it, you can format it some other way, it still knows, right? Uh, and, and part of this is because disks are these devices that were always sort of designed to have a, a, a more temporary relationship with the, with the operating system. All right, so, um, and you know, if, if you think about electronics time scale, right, when we're talking about things like memory, I mean, we're talking about electrons flowing from one you know, part of the system into another part of the system. Um, and on the mechanics time scale, we're talking about, again, the, the time that just needs to throw the heads an inch over, you know, 1.02 inches over in a certain direction. And of course, once you get there, you have to stop and then, you know, hold yourself really still and read some data. Um, I, I show this video every year. It's totally gratuitous. Uh, I just like it. Uh, so I just wanted to point out, I mean, th there are some interesting mechanical time scales as well. So uh, this is a table saw. <laughs> anyway, I'll just show the video. Oh, wait. Sorry, I'm showing it on mine. I got to show it over here. So this is this guy who built this really cool table saw. How many people have used a table saw before? Oh, wow. Really? <laughs> Why? Is that like a requirement? This is cool. Yeah. How many people have seen this table saw before? Wow. This one? Oh, I love this. You don't have this. I love this. I think you, I think unfortunately this destroys the blade, but it's better than your yeah. finger, right? So check this out. I love this. Boom. It's pretty cool, right? The hot dog is only nicked. <laughs> that, yeah, if that was your finger, you would appreciate it. Anyway. Okay. Yeah, I should have done it with his finger. Yeah, that's right. Do you really believe in your technology or not, man? Come on, use your real finger. <laughs> I always thought that was cool that Mac just raised the bar on this poor guy. <laughs> Steven Gass, PhD, saw stop inventor. <laughs> oh, does he? Video once he put it on and had his friend shoot him. See, I like that. That guy should do that. Um, so the the other thing that's interesting about the fact that disks move is that disks wear out and fail. Um, in a in a way that a lot of other uh, components on your system don't. Right. Um, Disk can fail incrementally as well, right? This has to, I'm assuming this has to do with something about you know, the disk manufacturing process. But there are disks that ship with portions of the disk that cannot be read or, read or written to, right? Um, and a lot of times, actually, disk software on modern drives is built to detect these sector failures, right? And sort of work around them. It, it, it gives you this illusion that the disk is this one big piece, but there's certain little pieces of it that disk is like, I know that part doesn't work, right? I don't trust that part of the disk. So when you tell me to write there, I write it somewhere else, right? To a part that I do trust. Um, there was a study recently where some people bought like hundreds, like a hundred copies of the same disk, right? In theory, the same disk. They bought them all at the same time, if I remember correctly, all from the same vendor identical models, and they found these massive performance differences between them, which is really interesting. Maybe not massive, but significant enough that you were sort of scratching your heads, being like, hey, I bought the same disk as my buddy, right? His is fast, mine is slow, why is that? 
Um, and over time, as, as you use drives, drives fail. Right? How many people have had a hard drive fail on them? How many people have, have had a hard drive fail on them that you didn't, that you didn't, you weren't the cause of, <laughs> the proximate cause of, other than using it? I mean, dropping your computer. I mean, come on. Um, well, but, I wish it was that stupid. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, so so over time, I mean, disks will fail. We'll talk uh, a little bit later as we get uh, deeper into the disk unit about some some neat uh, work on making disks more reliable. Right. So a lot of the architecture is sort of cloud computing even is built around these sort of assumptions. Right. I mean, Google, for example, I don't know how many it is now, but I'm guessing they have like thousands of disks that fail every day, right? They just have so many drives, right? At some point, when you take a small probability and multiply it by a big enough number, it becomes a big, a big number, right? I don't think so. I don't think the old email that you haven't read for like two years is stored on a flash drive. It could be, but I would doubt that. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, so you can, yeah, you can, you get tape. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah, p computers used to use magnetic tape, right, pre-disks. A lot of that stuff is gone, I think, except for, like, really deep archival purposes. But it's still, it's still around. Um, and then, as you guys, you know, the guys that put your hand down, right, you know this as well, right? I mean, disk can fail catastrophically uh, normally because you did something to it, right? Um, so going back to Adam's thing about grabbing, so... Uh, if you think about these heads that are floating nanometers over the surface of the disk, and then suddenly you give that disk a big shock, if the disk isn't prepared for it, and there are some, some things that disks do now to try to prepare for these types of events, that head will essentially be thrown into the disk. Once it starts making contact with the platter, it rips off a bunch of material. Um, do I have a video of this? Hold on. Yeah, there we go. Sweet. <laughs> um, yeah, so, and, and when that happens, this has happened to me, right? I mean, how many people have ever picked up their computer on the floor and it's like, it's like, uh, it's like it's death throes. It's looking at you like, you know it's over, right? And then it, it, you know, about 10 seconds later, it just totally freezes. And you're like, I should have backed up everything quickly. <laughs> um, right, so yeah. I oh, so many good disc videos out there. Okay, here we go. Head crash. I don't remember what... I don't know what this is. Oh, yeah, see? That's not a racing stripe. That's the material that came off. Oh, yeah. Filters out uh, very small particles of the drive. It's also quite dark, which is an indication that this uh, crash did, in fact, occur while the drive is running. This would be a classic <coughs> example of why you should always back up your data. <laughs> There had, there had to be a moral to the video somehow, yeah. So, so that, yeah, let me, let me just bring it up again so you guys, make sure you guys notice. So, it's, so yeah, so this, you know, again, this is not a racing stripe. This is, uh, th this is where the material has been scraped away from the, from the underlying drive substrate. And then, you know, again, I hadn't, I hadn't remembered this. Here, here you can see a little bit, you guys who were sort of curious about the spindle, can you see a little bit here how it has multiple levels? You can kind of see some of the underlying structure here uh, and actually even see a little bit of the platter rims right here as well as the, as the platters go down. Um, I, you know, I, I had forgotten, but you could have kind of assumed this. I mean, yeah, what happens if you get a little, like, piece of piece of lunch inside the disc, right? <laughs> like, it's like bouncing around in there, you know, like the heads are hitting in around. So you don't want that. So, you know, they do some, I guess they do some filtering here. And I guess what he's saying is that when this material was scraped off, the, the sort of the spinning action of the disc threw it out it, through the filter that's here to try to remove crap that could get into the disc. Um, so anyway, classic example of why you should always back up your data. Um, so, and, and later, later in this term, we'll talk about uh, a, a sort of approach to improving disk reliability that's based on uh, sort of making a lot of disks look like, like a single disk, All right? Um, and so the, the other thing about disks is because 
they're slow, we try to do a lot to work around that slowness, right? We've already talked a little bit about, you know, games the operating system plays in certain other parts of the system to make slow things look faster, to hide the latencies caused by disks. Um, and what's fun is that the operating system here is sort of directly involved in this process, right? And we get to, a, we get to a, uh, apply a lot of our sort of uh, usual system design principles to doing this, right? We use the past to predict the future when we're doing layout. We use memory to try to cache <laughs> disk writes and reads to improve performance. Uh, we delay doing things as long as possible uh, so that we can actually aggregate stuff in, in memory. Um, and, and again, when you think about memory latencies, I mean, memory to some degree is slow compared with the, with the processor, but modern processors usually handle a lot of this stuff themselves, right? So the operating system doesn't have as much visibility over what's happening. But here, this is all about sort of you know, good, good OS engineering. Um, all right, so let's talk about the, the process of actually reading or writing data to the disk, right? And we'll talk a little bit about where the, where the sources of latency come from, right? Um, <coughs> So the first thing I have to do is actually issue the command, right? This is a device. That device is sitting on the other side of some sort of bus in your system. Like, you know, old, if you have an old computer, maybe you used IDA with those terrible cables. Uh, and now, you know, SATA is better just for the cables. I mean, who, who cares, right? I don't even, I don't know, it's just thin, right? It's this huge ribbon of stuff you're trying to weave through the machine. Did anyone actually use an old IDA cable with those? Oh, yeah, those are terrible. Um, so, and, and so the, the, the command actually has to cross the bus, right, and make it to the drive. And then the drive has some thinking to do as well, right? The drive needs to do some planning to figure out which head am I going to actually use to satisfy this request, right? To some degree, I can't use any head, but I may still have some choices, yeah. Is it possible to use heads independently? Uh, so I can be reading or writing data from multiple heads independently. But as you've seen on those drives, the heads are all on one spindle, uh, sorry, one arm. So I can't move the two heads independently. My guess is that there have been disk designs with multiple arms, right? Uh, so you could have multiple independent heads. Uh, I don't know why they went away. You know, maybe they broke more often, right? I mean, that is one, I mean, that's one part of the disk where there's some significant sort of engineering effort required. So having two of them might just make the disk fail twice as fast. But normally, I can be reading or writing data from multiple heads at once, right? If they're in the right spot, that's the question. Um, so I need to figure out which head to use, which head services that part of the disk. Um, now I have to move the heads to the appropriate track. The data that the operating system wants to read or write is located on some sector. I told the disk, you know, I gave the disk some information about where I wanted to read or write. I have to do that. Uh, there's, so there's some addressing that goes on. But then the disk actually has to figure out what track is that on and how far do I need to go to get there. Um, once I get to the track, I have this subtle delay where I have to wait for the heads to stabilize because the tracks are very small. Now, sort of these two things can I, probably be done in parallel. I actually, remember, the tracks run all the way around the drive. So now I actually have to wait for the data to get there. Right? I have to sit there waiting for the... Uh, platter, which is rotating at a fixed rate, to bring the data that I want underneath the heads. Um, and finally, once the data has been read, usually this happens into an internal buffer on the disk, then I can deliver that data back to the, to the operating system. Right? Where do you think the main source of, a little trivia question, where's the main source of delay here? What do you think is the slowest part of this process? Yeah. Yeah, this, All right? Because this is the this is the one part where I really have a physical operation that has to be performed. It's really probably the seek and the settle time together, right? Getting the heads there and then waiting for the heads to stabilize. You know, the rotation uh, time has, you know, some, you know, so so over time the interconnects have gotten faster, right? So it's given me more bandwidth to get back and forth uh, data back and forth to the disk. Um, seek times are not have not really improved very much. I mean, they've, they've gotten better, but not very much. And rotation speeds, you know, you can get these like really, these server drives that probably sound like, the, like a jet engine taking off, right? But on some level, you're not optimizing the part of that's slow anyway, 
right? And you can double your rotation time, but if that rotation time is only 5% of the delay, then you're not making much of an improvement. We'll come back to talking about that sort of principle later when we talk about Omdahl's law. Um, so, and then the, the other thing that's important when we think about I.O. is people's sort of insatiable desire for storage. Right? People seem to have a lot of stuff. Right? I don't I really understand it personally. I mean, I guess I should complain. I've got a lot of crap. You know, I keep having to buy larger and larger drives. Um, but s somehow, maybe it's all the selfies we're taking or something like that. You know, our drives keep filling up. You know, we have like we don't we don't even need to put your selfie on your drive. Just post directly to Facebook. That's where it's going to go anyway. But, but yeah, I mean, people seem to have more and more storage. Well, isn't it also uh, programmed in such a heavy figure? Just just to some degree, yeah. But I, I think it's probably user generated content and data that's yeah. Yeah. taking up a lot of this, right? I mean, you're, you know, I, when I was in college, I had a 20 gigabyte drive, and that was big. That was like my storage drive for my, you know, my pilfered MP3 collection, right? You know, now I have, you know, like you know, several terabytes of storage, and I'm running out, right? So I don't know. I have a bigger MP3 collection, legally acquired. Um, <laughs> so, and if you look back, you know, yeah, I mean, <laughs> these these old drives are awesome, right? Like. The three and a, the th this is, I don't know, it's a trip down memory lane for me, right? I mean, the, the f there were, actually there was the five and a quarter disks. Maybe that's what these are, right? Anyway, has anyone used a computer that had a five and a quarter floppy inch drive? What about the, what about the, three, uh, what about the three and a half inch ones, the little plastic ones? Those were, those were better, right? So, so superior. Uh, yeah, I, I liked those old five and a quarter because you could see the disk. You know, it was like there was a little window there so you could look at it. I guess that was actually so it could be read, but whatever. Um, <laughs> but I remember just spinning those with my finger and being like, oh, like, how they store data. Ro <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. yeah, I mean, at least those you could get rid of. Uh, yeah, the, the, that's interesting. Um, so, you know, and, and, and now, you know, we're into this. And, and one of the things that's happened is, uh, the amount of, it, I wish I had a graph showing sort of like this speed versus memory size versus disks, right? So disks are not really, keep, have not kept up with speed improvements um, of the other parts of the system, but they are, have, have gotten a lot bigger, right? So, you know, when I, I worked at Microsoft about a decade ago and they were all worried about big, slow disks. Right, because it was turning out that disks were starting to become the bottleneck on a lot of consumer-facing systems, and you know people love having a big drive. They don't realize that big drive is really, really slow. Right, and again, it's like you know all these great improvements are happening to your other parts of the system. I've got 16 cores, you know, all running, all running at three gigahertz and 32 GB of RAM, and the thing is I/O bound. Right, so that that starts to not be good. Right. Um, and you know, and again, the seek times for these drives are always going to limit the abyss of, uh, ability of disks to keep up, right? Um, if you think about Moore's law, Moore's law is sort of fundamentally about taking one bit of data and splitting it into smaller pieces, right? That's sort of what Moore's law has done. Disks don't have the, can't scale this way, right? It's about getting from one point to another point faster, and that's we're not getting to do this. Um, all right, so, so disk, you know, the low-level disk interface is not something that you guys want to use, right? The low-level disk interface has to do with talking to the disk about, you know, which, exactly which sort of sector or, or, or block of information you want uh, to store data on. And so what we've done is we've built, you know, file systems are software that sits on top of these devices and provides you with the interface <coughs> that you guys are probably familiar with, files, directories, file attributes, being able to move things from place to place, growing and shrinking. Um, and all this is done entirely in software. I think that's the other reason that makes file systems sort of fun, right? You could take this low-level disk and you can give it all these sort of magical properties, right? Um, and yeah, I mean, if you look out there, I don't know, this was a couple years ago. I mean, there's all sorts of, I mean, you guys could go out after class. I wouldn't revise this because I would work on assignment two, but, and you could probably like, it'd probably take you half an hour or 40 minutes to find a drive and just format it with all these different file systems. Right? And they're all different, all pieces that's all really sort of very, very well designed, very mission critical pieces of software um, that, that you can use, right? Um, yeah, so let me, let me come back and talk about Flash for a minute before we wrap up. 
you know, on, on some level, Flash, because it doesn't have moving parts, doesn't suffer from some of these problems, right? Unfortunately, Flash has its own set of problems, right? Um, one problem with a lot of Flash technologies is you actually have to, before I can write, let's say I want to write one byte. Unfortunately, I have to erase 32K first, right? And then I have to rewrite the entire 32K block, right? That is unfortunate, right? Um, and Flash actually wears out, right? Um, and, and that wear through can happen pretty fast. We've actually, some of the phone, the smartphones that are part of my phone lab test bed have lasted about a year because the flash, uh, the flash drives have started to wear out, right? This is not physical wear, right? This is that the underlying uh, technologies don't survive uh, a, a huge number of write and erase cycles. Right? Um, yeah, and we'll 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 talk we'll, we will talk this year about uh, file system design for flash systems. It's, is is as I as I you know I usually want to keep some things in my head that are good exam questions, but that has been on an exam, so we could talk about it now. All right, so on Wednesday we'll t uh, today is Wednesday. On Friday we'll talk about. Um, Scheduling algorithms actually at the lowest level of the drive, right? So figuring out from the drive's perspective, if I get a bunch of requests, how do I schedule those so that I can uh, optimize the movement of the heads? And then we'll start talking about file systems and the types of abstractions that file systems support. Good luck on assignment two.